Hello, my name's Andy Jordan, and today I'm going to discuss geodetics and the history that Vickers had with them and the aircraft produced and the engines used in them. Now, geodesic, as you might hear it sometimes called, is a noun, geodetic as an adjective. So both are correct. So let's start with airships. A lot of people give Barnes Wallace the credit with inventing geodetics, whereas he actually didn't invent them. He modified and refined them. The first aircraft to use geodesics was the Schutterlands SL-1 airship. That was a rival company to Zeppelin, and that was a wooden geodesic air, air, airship, even. The second aircraft was the Latacot 6, first flew in 1924. It was a one-off, it was a French biplane, twin engine that used all metal geodetics. And then Barnes Wallace from there grasped the idea of geodetics. As I said, he refined them, modified them, and he first used them in the R100 airship, which first flew in 1929. It's not to be confused with the R101, which was an absolute disaster and didn't even last a year till it crashed in France. And from the airships, he then went on to designing aircraft, aeroplanes, and from here, we need to really go up to the aircraft factory now to see some exa examples of his work. The first geodetic aeroplane that Barnes Wallace designed was the Vickers Wellesley. I'd love to show you one, but unfortunately no surviving examples, but this was the engine that was used to power them. This is the Bristol Pegasus, nine cylinder, single row radial, 28 litre. So the Wellesleys, there was one prototype built, a production run of 176 in total, and the best, biggest production was between uh, March 1937 to May 1938, but the first one actually flew on the 19th of June, 1935. And that was flown by Matt Summers, Vickers Chief Test Pilot. So from now, that being the Wellesley, let's go on to the next creation using geodetics, the Wellington. So here we have the Vickers Wellington. This is a Mark 1A. This is the Brooklyn's Wellington that was recovered from Loch Ness. It crashed on New Year's Eve, 1940, with the loss of one of the crew. But that's another story in its own right, which I'll leave to somebody else. The Wellington, and the W by the way, instead of the conventional V, any aircraft that started with the letter W was for Wallace, meaning it was using the full geodetic structure. The Wellington was effectively known as the Wimpy, after J. Wellington Wimpy, in the very popular Popeye cartoons. Wimpy was a friend of Popeye's, and his passion in life was for eating burgers, and ideally not having to pay for them. So here we have a perfect example of a geodetic structure. Very light, very strong, they could sustain a massive amount of damage and still stay airworthy without losing too much of its structural integrity. So the geodetics is the shortest route between two points on a curved structure using a curve. Now the first marks of Wellington's, the 1, 1A and 1C, as I said, this is a 1A, the mark C, 1C superseded the B before the B went into production. Again, used the Bristol Pegasus engine, the nine cylinder 28 litre that we saw earlier. And from there, I'd like to take you up on the mezzanine floor, bearing in mind this is a, a medium bomber. Let's go to the mezzanine floor where we can get an aerial view and get an idea of the scale of this aircraft. So we're, here we have the Brooklyn's Wellington in the aircraft factory, looking at it from the mezzanine floor, our Robert, recovered from Loch Ness. You can see the geodetic structure. It also gives you an idea of the scale of the aircraft itself. Incidentally, the forerunner to this, as we've discussed, was the Wellesley. And in November 1938, three Wellesleys took off from Ismailia in Egypt in an attempt to break the 48-hour non-stop record Took one of them had to, had to land due to a lack of fuel. The other two went on to Darwin in Australia, a total flight of 7,158 miles. From here, as I said, there is the Bristol Pegasus engine. And now on the later marks of Wellingtons, we need to go back to the stratosphere chamber where we have examples of those. So follow me. So welcome back to the stratosphere chamber. From the Mark I Wellington and the 1A and 1C, we now go on to the Mark II, of which there were 400 produced, and they were powered by the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. 
from the Mark II, we go into the Mark III, for which we need to go over here. And the Mark III's were powered by the Bristol Hercules 38.7 litre, 14 cylinder twin row sleeve valve, five valves per sleeve radial engine. From the Mark III, we go to the Mark IV, 220 produced, powered by the Pratt & Whitney Double Wasp. That's an 18 cylinder, 46 litre twin row radial engine. From the Mark IV, we go to a one-off, the Mark V, and that was an experimental pressurized Wellington. And for that, again, we went back to the Bristol Hercules engine. So developed from the Mark V, 63 built, came the Mark VI, which again went back to the Merlin engine. Everything after the Mark VI went back to the Bristol Hercules engine, unless it was an earlier Mark that was dragged up to a higher spec that retained its original engines. The first Wellington flew from here at Brooklands on the 15th of June, 1936, in total, there were 11,461 produced, over 2,500 of those at Weybridge. The most common mark was the 10. There were 3,803 of those built. But by 1942, Bomber Command had fallen out of favour with the twin-engine bombers and gone on to the big four heavies, Avro Lancaster, Short Sterling, Handley Page Halifax. So the likes of the Wellington were pressed into different roles. So they could be used for coastal command, transport, magnetic mine, detecting and destroying, and there were even some versions that were used to develop the very early jet engines that Frank Whittle was developing as a flying test bed. From the Wellington, we now go on to the Warwick. It was basically a much larger version of the Wellington, at just over 10 feet wider wingspan and 50% heavier. Again, it was designed by Rex Pearson, Vickers chief designer, first flown, on the 13th of August, 1939. Most of them were powered again with the Pratt & Whitney Double Wasp, but the first prototype had the Rolls-Royce Vulture 2 engine in it. This was basically an X24. The second prototype went onto the Bristol Centaurus engine. That was an 18 cylinder like this, twin row, and that was 52.6 liters in capacity but that was retrofitted with the double wasp and the only other Warwicks that flew using the Centaurus engine was a one-off Mark I that was used as a development test bed for the engine and the GR Mark II 132 built torpedo bombers that could carry two 24 inch torpedoes or three 18 inch torpedoes. Now the Warwick had a very interesting arrangement. The armored versions had rear-firing barbettes. These were rear-firing cannon, or machine guns, mounted in the back of the engine nacelles and remotely controlled. Other versions of the Warwicks were used for air-sea rescue. I kept coming across this phrase, Lindholm gear. Turns out Lindholm gear, or the Mark IV version that the Warwicks would have carried, were five buoyant containers tied together with buoyant rope that would be flown upwind of whatever crew were in the water needing rescuing. It would be dropped. Out of the five containers, the central one was a self-inflating life raft of either nine man or 26 man capacity. The crew would get into that, haul in the other barrels, which contained rations, spare clothes, and bearing in mind the era, packets of cigarettes, hopefully with dry, light, uh, dry matches. Unfortunately, we can't show you a Warwick as there are no remaining examples, but we'll go in the workshop and you can have a look at some of the pieces of ours that you might have seen in an earlier video shown by John Rowland under the stratosphere chamber. So please come into the workshop. So here we are with part of our Vickers Warwick, which you may well have seen under the chamber in one of John Rowland's previous videos. And I'm currently trying to catalogue as well as possible, which is not an easy task, where every part came from and what it was and where it went on the aircraft. Now this particular one, I've only just recently discovered has a lot of very interesting history behind it. 
BOAC operated 14 Warwicks with commercial registrations on them. And they were used in North Africa and the Far East for postal routes for military service. In 1943, they were passed over and put back into military service to 525 Squadron, based at RAF Lynham in Wiltshire. This is one of the 14. Now this was on a rather covert operation. It flew from RAF Lynham on April the 15th, 1944, down to Cornwall, which was its stopover on its way to Gibraltar and then Algeria. But this could make a whole other story in its own right. But basically, it took off just outside Newquay, at two and a half miles northeast over the sea, there was a mid-air explosion at approximately 2,000 feet. And I found, managed to find a manifest of all the crew and passengers on board, and there was definitely something covert going on here. One of the passengers was found with a money belt strapped to his waist, containing 57,000 US dollars, and there was a attache bag found containing 45,000 pounds in brand new five pound notes. So this aircraft, as I said, crashed 17th of April, 1944, registration BV-247, which was its military registration given to it when it was passed on from BIAC. Our Vickers Warwick is a C Mark I, and in total there were 843 Warwicks built here at Weybridge. So leaving the Warwick, we now move on to the Windsor, which was designed by Barnes Wallace with Rex Pearson. Unfortunately, we can't show you them because again, there are no remaining examples. But basically, they were quite a lump. Powered by four Rolls-Royce Merlin engines. Very floppy wings. Apparently, it used to flap like a swan in flight. So underneath each engine nacelle was a set of basically Wellington undercarriage. So it had four sets of main landing gear. And again, it had the rear firing barbettes. This was first, they were actually built, not at Weybridge, they were built at Fox Warren, just down the road from here. There were 300 ordered, but only three built. First flown, 20th October, 1943, and they were completely scrapped in 46. So a bit of a flop, unfortunately. So I hope you've enjoyed your visit with us today. Please come and join us again in the Stratosphere Chamber where we have some more productions to put together for you. Goodbye.